Okay, we're going to cover the learning chapter or chapter 7. And as part of that, just to understand, learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior. So learning theorists mainly look at behavioral change. Cognitive learning is something quite different. We're going to cover it very briefly just for contrast. And then we'll move quickly on to classical conditioning, which you can think of as classical learning, and operant conditioning or operant learning. Cognitive learning is really just acquiring mental information. For instance, if you learn some of the information in your Introduction to Psychology textbook and I assess your learning through a test without looking at your behavior, that's cognitive learning. It's not a part of the classic or pure learning theory approach since it uh, focuses on mental processes. In contrast, classical and operant conditioning are going to look at observable behavior. Ivar Pavlov is thought of as the um, father of classical conditioning, and Pavlov was actually um, a physiologist by training, and his contributions to learning theory were in addition to his Nobel Prize winning work on uh, digestion in dogs. Just to learn more about him, you can... Um, Go to YouTube and just type in classical conditioning, Ivan Pavlov, and it'll take you to uh, a tape that tells you a little bit about his background. Now the next slide is just going to show you the classic setup of Pavlov's dog, and again, his basic research was really on salivation and digestion, and so the whole work on classical conditioning just came from his uh, interest in a phenomenon that he observed. And what he found was that even though he was interested in salivation to food, he found that the dog started salivating when no food was present. And then he observed it carefully and noticed that it started salivating when it heard the lab assistant getting the food ready. And so that sparked his interest in classical conditioning. So we'll take a look just quickly at the view of Pavlov's dog and then we'll dive into the definitions. So here is the setup of Pavlov's dog, and as you can see in the classic um, work that he did, he was interested in looking at salivation um, in response to food, and that extended into his work in classical conditioning. Some of the terminology associated with uh, classical conditioning, UCS means unconditioned stimulus, and unconditioned basically means unlearned. It naturally causes or evokes an unconditioned response. So in Pavlov's experiment, food given to a dog was an unconditioned stimulus. The unconditioned response occurs naturally and automatically. And in Pavlov's experiment, salivation was an unconditioned response that occurred naturally to the presentation of food. The conditioned stimulus is introduced by the researcher. It's something that's neutral before conditioning. And so in Pavlov's experiment, it was the sound of a bell. Now, before conditioning or before learning, the bell did not elicit salivation, but after conditioning, it did elicit salivation. So Pavlov, in order to train the dog, rang a bell each time food was presented. And what he found is over time, with several pairings, the dog would salivate just to the bell alone. When the dog salivates just to the sound of a bell, that's a learned or conditioned response that occurred when the conditioned stimulus was presented. And so again, if the dog salivated when only the bell was presented, now you have a conditioned stimulus of the bell eliciting the conditioned response of salivation. It's not a natural connection, and that's what the word conditioned implies. It must have been learned. So again, just to reiterate, the UCS-UCR link is natural, and the CSCR connection is learned, whether we're talking about animals or people.
Speaking of people, there's a very famous study that John Watson conducted where he classically conditioned a child, little Albert, to be afraid of white rats. This is very unusual for psychologists. Most of us spend our entire career trying to help people, but he was kind of a, um, a different human being, we'll say. And so what he wanted to see is if he could make a tiny child terrified of a white rat through classical conditioning. And so um, he started out before conditioning just showing that the rat was a neutral stimulus. Like most children, little Albert or the child was actually attracted to the rat. It looked like a neat little toy to him. And so it didn't elicit any fear reaction whatsoever, which is important to establish before your intervention. However, the child did naturally show fear to a loud sound, and this is a fear that all of us keep our whole life. If somebody popped a balloon behind your head right now, you'd jump out of your seat without even thinking of it. So the lab assistant struck two bars together behind little Albert's back, and of course it scared him to death. And so you can probably guess where this is going. At this point, we know the loud sounds an unconditioned stimulus that naturally evokes unconditioned response of fear. Now during conditioning, you pair the loud noise with the presentation of the rat. Very, very quickly, little Albert learned that when he heard the loud noise that, that was paired with the rat, that, you know, fear was going to occur. And he didn't even have to think about it. It happened naturally. So after a very few pairings, all you had to do was just showing the rat by itself, and he was afraid of the rat because of its repeated pairing with this loud sound. At the point at which little Albert was afraid of the rat, by itself, without the noise, the rat is a conditioned stimulus and fear was a conditioned response. And so Watson showed that the little uh, child could be conditioned to fear a rat. He also played around with little Albert a little bit more and this old picture you can see Watson um, with a creepy white furry Santa Claus mask right in front of little Albert and you can see kind of from the body posture of little Albert he's afraid because uh, the mask is white and furry like the rat was white and furry. This is called stimulus generalization when the participants conditioned reaction generalizes to stimuli that are similar but not identical to the original conditioned stimulus. So the child was afraid of the Santa mask because it was white and furry like the rat. Now there's also stimulus discrimination, which happens when the new stimulus is too different. And so for instance, if Watson brought a black dog into the room, little Albert would no longer be afraid because it's too different from the white rat. This is just another example of classical conditioning. If you go to YouTube and type in classical conditioning at BGSU, it'll take you to a um, example of how quickly classical conditioning can occur in humans. Some applications of classical conditioning include systematic desensitization or counterconditioning and used in a much more positive way than what, how uh, Watson used the paradigm. What you might want to do if somebody has a phobia of spiders is to try to decrease the fear. And we know that the spiders are conditioned stimulus and fear is a conditioned response. Fear of spiders is not something we're born with, it's something that we learn. And so you may ask yourself, how do you do this in some kind of humane systematic way? One way to do it is to pair the spider with relaxation or some other pleasant stimuli to kind of decrease fear. When you do this in kind of gentle stages, it's called systematic desensitization, and it's actually one of our most effective treatments of phobias. Let's move to operant conditioning. This is a totally different paradigm or model than classical conditioning. In operant conditioning, you require the subject to make a voluntary action or a single behavior. This action is followed by a consequence called a reinforcer or a punishment. On the next page, you'll see a Skinner box. It's just kind of a classic part of operant conditioning. And in this particular instance, what happens is the rat learns to press a bar, which is a voluntary behavior, to get a treat, which is a reinforcer that strengthens bar pressing. 
And so here you see the Skinner box, and typically it's very controlled environment. You can see little Purina rat chow pellets in the dispenser, and rats learn very quickly all kinds of different patterns of bar pressing to get this food. This is just a bad idea, just for um, reference. Skinner actually tried to extend this to babies, and it was actually... You know, a good idea in principle, he designed a box that he let his daughter sit in for short periods of time where she could pull a lever to get drink or food, but people were kind of horrified by this and thought it was too isolating. So, a bad idea based on a wonderful theory. Let's take a look at the terminology associated with operant conditioning. A reinforcer always strengthens behavior, and maybe you can remember this by remembering a reinforcement in a building always strengthens it. If it's positive, it's a reward. So, for instance, if you raise your grades and your parents gave you a car um, and you continue to raise your grades, by definition, the, the car is a reinforcer for that kind of behavior. A negative reinforcer also increases behavior, but it increases it because you want to avoid the outcome. So if your parents say if you don't increase your grades, you're going to be grounded and you increase your grades, that grounding, that threat, is serving as a negative reinforcement. Both reinforcers always increase behavior, and that's how you keep reinforcers separate from punishment. Another distinction is between a primary reinforcer that just satisfies a biological need like food or water and a conditioned or secondary reinforcer that gets its power through psychological associations. For instance, money, friendship, affiliation, those are all secondary reinforcers of behavior. Punishment is the only outcome that always decreases of targeted behavior, the only thing that decreases it. It does tend to have very negative side effects. We know that it's often administered when people are angry, and so punishment is not as effective as other means like using positive reinforcement to strengthen behavior. Just as an application of operant conditioning, if you have the audio version, which we're using now, you can, you can just copy and paste into YouTube the following statement. The Gothowitz deviation, and Gothowitz is G-O-T-H-O-W-I-T-Z deviation, D-E-V-I-A-T-I-O-N, season three, episode three on YouTube. And it's a clip from a popular show that shows you how to use operant conditioning. Just a quick comparison of the two paradigms or models for you. In classical conditioning, Pavlov's dog, the reaction of salivation was involuntary. It was out of the dog's control. In operant conditioning, for instance, rewarding salespeople for selling cars, selling cars is totally voluntary. The response, the nature of the response of salivation in classical conditioning is elicited or automatic. And in operant conditioning, again, it's omitted. It's under the control of the subject. So two very different, basic, uh, but powerful ways to understand human learning. And that concludes our discussion of the learning chapter.